Let's give a hand. The speakers today were great. It was. Um, yeah, indeed. And the curation. It was really a fantastic day. And I'm grateful to the organization, the curation of the speakers and the speakers. Um, what a day. And any day that makes Oog Sweeney feel like he leaves smarter than he came is a good day in my book. <laughs> Uh, also grateful that Janine and your clips uh, about the NFB, you showed the wonderful film by Guy Madden, uh, The Seances, which is about loss. Uh, the, the, everyone who sees a film is seeing that film for the first and last time, thanks to the newest technology, uh, newest deployments of algorithms. So old meets new in a really wonderful way. I just want to step back initially and put what we've been talking about in a bigger context. We've been talking here about interactive documentaries, ephemeral objects that we all love. But really what they're part of, they're the, they're the, they're, to say it's the tip of an iceberg is, is ridiculous, but they're a small piece of a much bigger set of changes that are happening. And I'll even use the word paradigm shift. Thomas Kuhn uses this word uh, to talk about shifts in our understanding of the cosmos. When physicists believe the world works a certain way for hundreds of years, and suddenly there's a switch, and everything that they knew doesn't work quite that way anymore. And I use this word because the paradigm shift uh, that I'll, I'll talk about in a couple of senses has everything to do with our notions of professional behavior. So uh, uh, what we heard about from Nancy uh, and um, from Patricia. Uh, these are people who are professionals, schooled in certain ways of thinking, top of their business, working at MIT and the Tate. And what they're up against are behaviors that are institutionalized, coming from a certain point of view. And when, when the world starts to shift, those professional behaviors that they're up against can be very, very difficult to, to, to fight against. Um, they're up against existing policy assumptions. Policies are made for certain reasons. Policies, certainly about preservations, have certain assumptions. The politicians and the, the functionaries that, ha that, that drive them, that inform them, are coming from a world where certain things are taken for granted, have been taken for granted for hundreds, a couple of hundred years. And that's the conditions for that are changing. So I think paradigm shift is a, is a really good word here. And I want to talk about this quickly in a couple of ways. First of all, there's the obvious shift from the kind of analog material to the digital. But what does that actually mean in, in terms of what we've been talking about today? To me, it means we're going from a world where the artifacts we save are, are fixed artifacts. A book is fixed. We can quibble about different variants of Hamlet or the Bible, of course. But by and large, people understand the book or the film or the uh, recording of the Beatles' first recording of whatever. It's basically fixed. There's a complete version possible or thinkable. And that's completely different from the digital domain, where we have endless versions, where we have updates, where user contribution is part of this scenario, where adaptations, the sort of morphing of systems over time, uh, is something that is, is part of the game. This is a very different entity. What's the right version? There's endless reboots and refixes and updates. There is no correct form. In cinema, you might go back to the release version, but you can't do that. I mean, you, you could do it with software, but why would you? That's not how it works. Um, we talked uh, in this last panel about the, 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 a world where uh, Monique was talking about, a world where filtering used to occur in th the hands of the, of, the, of, the, of the writer and the director um, before the stuff was shot. And that, we're now in a world where maybe that went to the editor. But now in the world of YouTube, it doesn't really happen that way anymore. So we could talk about this as a world of kind of heavily filtered elite production. You know, some kind of social elite is responsible versus a kind of world where there's good stuff and bad stuff, a lot of bad stuff. But really, we're talking about a difference in access. And that requires a different way of thinking about it. Yes, there's a lot of crap out there, a lot of digital crap. But there are also a lot more voices represented than have ever been represented before. 
It's not about the filtering of people that get to make media. Now it's unfiltered. So yes, there's a lot of garbage, but yes, there are many more voices. So we need to rethink how we make our filtration for what we save, not on the basis of good or bad necessarily, but on the basis also of who is able to speak. Um, the notion of the performative here, the, 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 that Zachary spoke about, the dance between the user and the technology, this is really, really crucial. And, helps us in a certain way rethink even our legacy media forms. So for example, if you think about, uh, and, and this is my second point, if we have a paradigm shift in the digital analog, there's a paradigm shift that's been taking place in media studies. Media studies, for, for much of its history, have been about texts. They've been about you know thinking about the text, understanding what it means and where it came from, and is this the good version or not. And over the last 20 or so years, kind of the same period where the digital is emergent, there's been a lot more interest in media, not so much as text or as apparatus, but media as practice. Media as what people do with it. What's the surround? What's the, what meetings does it have? How is it negotiated? How does it, how does it come into life? What are the systems? What are the production processes? So what we're talking about here with saving the wrap, saving the surround, that what we saw with High Rise as such a good example is actually something that's rippling back through the world I just sort of mischaracterized as being about fixity. It's no longer so much. It's changing the way we think about these older uh, forms, changing the way we think about the book, Adrian John's wonderful work on the nature of the book, changing the way we think about film by shifting our discourse to be about uh, film practice. It's as if we've been obsessed for a long time about saving shells, you know, shells of snails, like that's the film in a way, when in fact what we're missing is the little meaty little beast inside that leaves a trail. Those trails and the snail itself are also part of the picture. So that's a paradigm shift that's really important and we're trying to come to terms with it because what does it mean practically speaking? Um, there's a paradigm shift going on, of course, in terms of how we think about the archive. Derrida spawned a new generation of thinking about the archive. Derrida and Foucault, of course. Um, and you know, Rick talked about the, the sort of post-archival moment that we're into. There are plenty of people, and one that I'm inspired by a lot is uh, Wolfgang Ernst, uh, despite maybe his relationship with Hitler, but still he's a really interesting thinker. Uh, the, it's no accident that the rise of media archeology span uh, for all its pluses and minuses, the, the rise of non-representational theory. There's a lot of stuff in the academy that's been emerging that's struggling with the notion of what is this archive. Archive is a really loaded word. The arche part in Greek for archeology, span archive, also is about governance. I mean, what it was is about governance. It's the sort of the source, the, 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 the repository of what allows order and law to prevail. The relation between archive and policy is a very deep one, a very profound one. We think of it and we talk about it on an instrumental level, but actually what we keep has everything to do with who we are and what the future will be. It is the kernel of governance. Um, access, of course, and the, and the post-archival within that, it, crucial. The issues of dominance, so this is stepping outside the, but it's still part of this paradigm uh, shift. S issues of social justice, of understanding the bias that's hardwired into our software, that's hardwired into our systems of collection. Uh, that's really crucial, and I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, Juchumba and Rick for, for talking about that. It requires a reframing, and it goes back to what I said about this abundance. The abundance can be seen as noise and nonsense, but it also, something else is there. So this, this reframing of it in terms of access and issues of dominance is a crucial one. I want to just point to a couple of quick things and I'll shut up. One, Brett talked about loss. He talked about the 410 code. That's really important because right now in the world of museums, um, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of movement of, especially people from uh, uh, cultures whose objects have been appropriated and they want their objects back. And they don't just want their objects back to put them in their museums, they want their objects back to destroy them. So for example, there's some beautiful tortoiseshell masks made in the Torres Strait Islands by the Aboriginal peoples. And they want them back because what those represent souls. And what you do with those masks is you bury them in wet sand and in five years they're gone. That's what their function is. And right now they're in a lot of museums around the world, and there's a campaign to get those back so they can destroy them. It goes against the grain of 
our inherited ways of thinking about museums and culture, but actually disappearance is also part of culture, an active part of culture. Okay, let's make a holographic scan or a, a VR scan or something, and that's actually what they're encouraging, like, scan this thing, do your best, take, take whatever technologies you have and throw it at it, and keep the copy. We're gonna take the original and destroy it. The 410 code is really interesting in that regard, and uh, I think the act of destruction and the act of disappearance is, is, can, be, can be actually sometimes a great thing. Sandra mentioned something as a little throwaway, but it's a very, very important point, failure. We keep the success stories. We keep the stuff that wins. But if we've learned anything from historians of science, especially people with social construction of technology notions of science, it's that failure is the best teacher. When things go wrong is when you really learn. When they're great, you're like inspired or you're, you're, you're in awe, maybe you don't do anything because you can't compete. But failure opens us up to actually try stuff. So what are we gonna do? <laughs> what the hell are we gonna do about that? Jason gave us an alt a, a way to do it, save everything, the Noah's Ark approach. And actually, the Internet Archive is doing it. And they're doing it, I mean, I have no clue what it costs. But uh, I do want to just uh, reiterate Brett's appeal to like send them money. That makes good sense to me. Um, it's a really interesting idea. And it, it's out there. And it's been chugging away for, for 20 years. That's astounding. And that's a great approach. We also have a lot of strategies to filter, inherited strategies. Again, just to re re repeat what I said, that's where we need to kind of rethink how we want to do that. Of course, our historical judgments are important, but we have to keep the door a bit open for the judgment that future historians will make. Um, last but not least, a few words. So tomorrow's roundtable is, cl is closed, uh, alas, but it's where I hope the conversations we've had today will, will kind of take an edge. Um, Marianne talked about the tension uh, between innovation and preservation. Innovation is a driver of technology. Innovation and innovative applications really help to make te technologies take on new forms and new directions. But they are really wickedly hard to save. They're incredibly unstable. So there is that tension, and we need to talk about that tension. Uh, because this part of the doc world, this part of the media world, is the, is the kind of cutting edge. It's where the, tech, where the innovation is happening. So we're, this is the worst case scenario in terms of preservation strategy. That, that's the place to have the debate. I hope what we do tomorrow is kind of have a pincer's move between uh, the big questions, uh, the, a lot of the, the stuff I like to talk about, which is always kind of the big implications or the big, the, the, the big framing uh, strategies. But on the other hand, the pragmatics of what can we do now? What should we do now? How can we operationalize this stuff in a way that already starting now can start to, you know, we've heard, and, and um, I'm sorry, I think it was uh, Mr. Gaginot who said it, all these organizations that have been busy with this work and it's kind of just gone. That happens. Um, we're working, Sandra and I, in the world of VR right now. And uh, sorry, don't see with my glasses on. Um, it's incredible the amount of VR hype and activity in the early 90s that today's practitioners, even if they were part of it, don't remember. Like, it's incredible. So we, we, do, we are prone to reinvent the wheel. And I think we need to be very concrete and uh, Think lofty thoughts, but on the other hand, be practical and see what we can do now. Um, policy and funding is obvious, obviously the space where that happens. And we're going to just, I think we should sort of cull the best practices that we've talked about today. It's clear there's a lot of overlap in thinking there and uh, push this in the next direction. So I love the phrase, the one phrase I'll say that I really love today, access is a driver for preservation. If you look at the film world, when did Sony and MGM start throwing buckets of money at preservation? It's when DVDs and streaming services began. There was a new market. OK, excess with a charge in that case. But it woke them up to the value of their archives. And I think you know we have to really, whatever arguments it takes, but I think at the end of the day, that's a great way to think. Access is a driver for preservation. Thank you all for being here. It was a splendid day, and I appreciate your.